What's up, guys? Uh, so I, I am the founder of a technology company, and I make videos and put them on the internet. Uh, that's what I do. And when I was doing some research about this event and, and trying to understand who would be here in the audience uh, and what today would be about, and try to try to form and patty my talk to be most appropriate, I landed on one place and, and that I thought would be most meaningful, and that is this sort of brave new world of media that we live in where it's, it's democratic, it's a meritocracy, we all have the same entry point. I started my YouTube channel the same way that like my kids' friends in school start their YouTube channel. Uh, and I think what people often fail to see is what's required to actually succeed today in this space. It's a swimming pool we can all jump into, but how do you actually how do you thrive there? Um, the short answer to that big question is I have like no fucking idea how to succeed. People always ask me how to grow their YouTube channel, I have no idea. But I know how I did it, and I thought I would share that with you today. Um, so going all the way back, uh, you know, I started making videos on my, like my iMac computer, the really old one, the one that looked like a, like a big purple pink toilet, remember that one? Late 90s. I had a handle on the top. And when I would finish the video, I had nowhere to put it. So I used to like upload them to my iDisk server and then email people my password and they would go on there, log on, put in my password, and then download the QuickTime video and then they could watch my video. But it worked. That was a way of me getting my content in front of other people. And I absolutely fell in love with that. I fell in love with this idea of being able to share something that I made, something that was important to me. Um, it was something that I was so passionate about, so excited about that I really like in that moment, in those early, early days of, of digital video, I, I knew that this was the trajectory that I wanted to follow for my entire career. Um, I didn't know what that meant. And I think that that lack of understanding of what the future might hold for someone like me is probably more true today than it was 16, 17 years ago when I started. That is, when you sort of make that decision, when you decide to choose a career um, or to pursue a career or to pursue a, a, a passion that is in this, this landscape, you have no idea how it might manifest. There are people today who call themselves Snapchat influencers and they make a living doing just that. Um, I think I heard someone laugh when I said that, but I have a friend who's a Snapchat influencer. That's all he does. And last year he made over a million dollars. Um, so I think that there's a lot more to it than most people, especially people who are entrenched in the media world, give it credit for. But the risk, and this is a risk that, that I didn't understand 17 years ago, but is more vivid now than ever, is that the trajectory, what this space is going to look like in the future is this wild unknown. It's this scary, dark place that changes so quickly that by the time you arrive at the place you set out to go to, it's already changed and it looks nothing like the place you set out to, uh, you set out to go to when you initially started. Um, so for me, like, I started because I had nowhere else to go. I had nowhere to put my videos, so I dumped them on that, that iDisc. Uh, my dream was to one day have a TV show. My dream was to, like, make movies that people went to the theaters to see. Like, that was, like, the fucking pie in the sky. That was the ultimate. I couldn't imagine something that was greater than someone, like, buying a movie ticket and going to see my movie or, like, getting, getting accepted to the Sundance Film Festival. These were the benchmarks of success in media when I was a kid. These were the things I set out to do. Um, so my bio, what it looked like is, is, you know, I moved to New York City, I was like a bike messenger, which is the most horrible job ever. Uh, on top of like getting hit by cars all the time, I had a cell phone. This is in the early 2000s. Remember when you had to pay for minutes? You only had like a certain amount of minutes? Well, the amount of minutes that I would use in a given month to be a bike messenger, ex the cost of them exceeded my paycheck as a bike messenger. So it was a net loss. I used to lose money being a bike messenger. But I made videos. I made videos while I did it and I loved it. Then I slowly, slowly found my footing. Um, I found my footing in that people would hire me to make like wedding videos and birthday videos and anything that anyone would write me a check to do that involved a camera, I would take. Um, it was the hustle. 
Uh, it was a hustle like nothing else. It was an absolutely terrifying, scary, horrible, beautiful, wonderful place to be. I never knew how I might make a living. I never knew where my next paycheck would come from, but I was doing something that I was truly passionate about. Um, and I just did that, and I kept doing that. And I met a guy who was like, hey, do that for me. And I did that for him. He's like, this is great. Let's do something bigger together. And we did something bigger together. And they said, let's do something even bigger together. And I was like, okay, here's this idea. Give me enough money for like a year. And in that year, my brother and I, my brother and I worked together very closely for the first decade of my career. My brother and I will just make a whole bunch of stuff. And he was like, okay, that seems fair. Uh, there aren't enough people like this guy who wrote me that check, by the way. But if you find them, hang on to them. And we started making content. We just made content. And every six weeks, we'd have a meeting with this guy. His name was Tom Scott. And he'd say, okay, show me what you got. And we'd show him like this pile of short videos. And he'd be like, okay, this is good. Keep going. And we just kept making these videos. And then six months into this one-year deal, he was like, what is this? And we're like, I don't know. But like, if we add all the videos together, it sort of adds up to almost a half an hour. That's what a TV show is, right? Let's call it a TV show. And we continued on that trajectory until we had what felt like an actual TV show. And just like parenthetically, what that meant was we just like linked together all of our short videos that look exactly like my YouTube videos, but we put a title at the beginning and credits at the end, and we're like, this is a TV show. Um, I laughed too, but like it worked. Uh, and, and I remember we went to LA to like shop that around, which is a fucking humiliating experience if anyone's ever tried to sell something that they like put their heart into. And we'd show it to some people, and they're like, okay, I don't get it. We showed it to some other people, the most insulting is when they're like, three minutes into it, they'd be like, I get it. And I'm like, you don't fucking get it, man. It's 20 minutes long. Um, but eventually we showed it to HBO. They loved it. And they wrote us a check for a couple million dollars for it. Um, and that show went on HBO. And then in the years after that, I did make feature films, feature films that were accepted and invited and brought to and screened at the Cannes Film Festival and the Sundance Film Festival. And then... In 2010, which I would say is like the crescendo, the absolute peak of this mainstream success, that is when I had a show on HBO that was premiering a new episode every week. And it was the same time that the feature film that I just produced that premiered at Cannes, that premiered at Sundance, won an Independent Spirit Award. And I like got to go on stage and accept this award from like a beautiful movie star. And like my parents got to see it on TV. And I was like, they let me carry the fucking award on an airplane. This thing is like a weapon. But the guy was like, hey, all right, come on through. And I was like sitting on that airplane. And you know that thing that happens when you're on an airplane and you have your headphones on and your like face is pressed up against the window and like a sad song comes on and you just get fucking horribly emotional. You're like, why am I crying? And you just start freaking out. I was having one of those moments and I think what it was, what, what I was responding to is that I had spent the previous two and a half years not creating, but I had spent the previous two and a half years sort of working the politics that was the media industry. Getting up on that stage to accept that award, sure, it, was, it, it spoke to the merit of the film that we had made, but more so, the amount of steps it took to get there. There was a tremendous amount of nepotism. There's a tremendous amount of sort of bobbing and weaving through this political system. Um, how did we get the meeting with HBO in the first place? Like there were all these unfair advantages and all these chess pieces that had to be moved around. And in all that, it had completely consumed me. And I had gotten away from the thing that I loved the most, which was like sitting at home, working on my new iMac, making little videos. And it was at that moment that I decided, uh, I would just say, fuck it and I, I'm just gonna go back and make videos and put them on the internet. And I remember like my big Hollywood agent at the time was like, that's crazy, you don't do that. And when I spoke to my commercial rep, like my commercial agent, the person who like got me these really sweet jobs directing TV commercials, and I was like, I just wanna make internet videos, so find me companies that will like give me money to make internet videos for them. She was like, good luck with that, Casey. And I really felt alone. And I just put my head down and I started making videos. Um, I was not immediately successful. Uh, I remember like three or four months into it, I had five or six videos up. I think I had 200 subscribers and a few thousand views. I remember like my kids' friends in high school had more views than I had on YouTube and I had a show on HBO at the same time. And that was a really tough thing. It was a tough pill for me to swallow, but 
I think it underscored why I was focused on that in the first place, which is that like a guy who's a successful filmmaker with a show on HBO has no advantages over like a 14-year-old kid who's in high school. And I love that. And then I made this one kind of stupid video and things just kind of blew up. So I'm going to show you this kind of stupid video right now. Um, because this video was the turning point for me. This video showed me more so than anything else what the potential of, of making movies online was. I'm getting a ticket for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Valid and guilty, not guilty. Everything you need What's to the fine? The so you're a bicyclist, so it's, it's anywhere um, from $10 uh, up to $130, depending on your racket. But it's a bicycle sum, it's a bicycle sum, just for not riding in a bicycle lane. You know. Instructions that keep you from properly riding in the bike lane. up. As you've been hearing on our show and elsewhere, the police continue to crack down on biking infractions. As the number of bikers explodes throughout the city, ticketing is on the rise. Casey in Manhattan, you got a ticket this month? Uh, yeah, I got a, a ticket about three weeks ago for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Not in the bike lane. Alex is holding up a sign that says, <laughs> you could have just said it. Oh, okay. His sign says, not illegal. Yeah. I wish I had known that before I paid the $50 ticket. Well, so... Th I put that movie out there and all of a sudden it, you know, it does like 5 million views in a day and the mayor of New York City has to answer to it in a press conference. The New York Times calls me and they're like, hey, will you make videos like that for us? And I was like, sure, you're calling the right guy. Um, and all sorts of wonderful things happened. But the thing for me, the thing that affected me the most was I didn't have to ask anyone's permission to make that movie. I was like pissed off because I didn't want to have to pay that $50 ticket. And I was like, this is bullshit. So I went and made a video about it. Um, and that was it. There was, no, there was no filters between me and what ended up being close to 20 million viewers. I wanted to create something, so I created it, and then I shared it with the world. All of that politicking, applying to film festivals, getting the right meeting with the right person, having an agent tell me this isn't good enough for the internet, this isn't good enough for... T None of that existed. It was just me and an audience. Like, that was the beauty of the internet. That was the beauty of all of it. Um, so I continued on that trajectory and I committed everything I had and everything I was and everything I was doing to creating movies online. Um, and, and that was five or six years ago, five years ago, six years ago, five years ago, 520 movies ago. It's a lot of movies. Um, and, and in that time, there's been so much I've taken. I think that the entire landscape of, of media has changed wildly. 
I think it used to be called digital media and then online media, and now it's just called media. And, and the movies and the kinds of works that I put out, sometimes I call it a vlog and sometimes I call it a show. And I think at the end of the day, people have a finite amount of time and what they commit their eyeballs to is what they like. And I think the internet's doing a really wonderful job of furthering that. When I was a kid, I watched Nickelodeon and MTV because I had nothing else to watch. This is what was being served to me, so that's what I consumed. But now, now media and the way and the places in which we consume it, they're, all, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere and you can see exactly what you want to see, which makes a wildly competitive landscape. There are so many eyeballs and so many hours in a day and how do you get in front of people? You have to make content that people want. Um, and I think it's arriving at a really fair, really open place. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, is the power of influence and what influence actually means. Um, influence is something that's new for me. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about it is because I fucking hate being called an influencer. And like my agent brings me these like, thanks, these jobs all the time. And it's like influencer marketing campaign. That is like the worst, most offensive swear word you can call someone as an influencer. But I, 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 I still think it's something that's important to discuss because influence is real. And what influence is today uh, and again, this is something I'm learning about all the time. This is something that's wildly new. But I think that in the world of marketing, there is nothing greater than influence. There's nothing more effective than influence. And I think years ago, when TV was it, uh, marketers could bullshit their way to convince people that their 30-second spot that aired on Tuesday nights, this many people saw and it had this much impact. And that was good enough for companies to write checks to buy that 30-second spot. But the, the fun and games are over, the smoke and mirrors over. Now there are real quantifiable metrics. You can actually see who's paying attention to what in the most granular way. So now we can actually see, we can actually see like in a really tangible new way, we can see what the impact of, of, of influence actually is. Um, and for me, that's meant a bunch of wonderful things. It, meant, it means I get to like drive fast Mercedes Benz in the south of France, um, which is cool. But it also means that I, on occasion, get opportunities to do things that I really want to do. Um, and, and where I'm arriving with this is I want to leave you guys today showing you a video um, that is a commercial. This is an advertisement. Um, but it's also the video of all my videos. It's one of the ones that I'm most proud of that I was most passionate about in making, um, that really meant the world to me. But the only reason why I was in a position to create the, the video that I'm about to show you guys is because of a combination of all the factors that I talked about today. And ultimately, the influence that all of those factors have, have lent to me. So when a client, a company comes to me and they say, here's some money, will you, make, will you advertise our product? Um, I say, okay, and I'm put in a position where I can make a movie like this. Um, I'm gonna walk off the stage after I play this movie, so I'm just sort of preparing you for that. But thanks for being a patient, don't applause. Thanks for being a patient audience. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the actual correspondence. Dear Casey, 20th Century Fox is releasing a new movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. We want to run a campaign under the concept, Live Your Dreams. The collective theme of this initiative will be to motivate, inspire, and give people a catalyst to do something they've never done. We'd like to know if you'd be interested in creating a video about living your dreams. And this is the actual response I sent to them. Here's my concept. Give me the budget, I'll go to the Philippines and spend every penny helping people in need. Okay, so...
right, thank you for your help. So we're gonna try to clean this place out. How many of these do you have? This is what the secret life of Walter Mitty's promotional video budget looks like. So we just arrived. We're unloading the buses with the help of all these people. No idea who these people are. I guess this is the house we're gonna be staying in tonight. There's no electricity or anything here, but they do have generators. That's 500 back, so uh, we have about 500 more to go. I don't think that we bought enough food. Thank you. 